Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, where I recommend movies and talk about them. Is the microphone in the show? Okay, the microphone's out of the shot. Okay, I thought it was in the shot. What's this then? Oh. Little ba-bomb. Ba-bomb's in the shot. Or bomb bomb That's what they're called in the games. But in the movie, ba-bomb. Last time, I recommended some mummy movies. Uh, starting with the original mummy movie, The Mummy. So, The Mummy, the very first mummy movie starring Boris Car- Well, hmm. I think George Milliers did, like, a- like, The Tomb of Cleopatra or something. It's not like- it's not like this is the first movie about mummies. It's just- The first big movie about mummies, I suppose. The first The Mummy movie. Um, the- the, the movie to make The Mummy, like, a horror staple. Stars uh, Boris Karloff as Imhotep, He's an ancient Egyptian man who who was in love with the the pharaoh's daughter, and when she died, he found this scroll of resurrection to bring her back. But apparently, the scroll of resurrection was horrible and unholy. It, it was blasphemy against the gods, even though they gave it to us. Why would you give us a scroll of resurrection if we're not supposed to use it? So he uses the scroll of resurrection, which he's not supposed to do, and uh, so so they trap him in they they wrap him up and put him in this secret tomb so that no one can ever find him or find the the secrets of uh, of of resurrection. They buried him alive is the thing, and. Well, wouldn't you know it, a couple of uh, British archaeologists are digging around and they find Imhotep's grave, and that brings him back to life, because curses and shit. They make this a little clearer in uh, the This Mummy, the Hammer Horror one. In that one, they say Imhotep is cursed to live forever inside the tomb, so that's... That's why he uh, comes back to life when they, they find his tomb, right? Because he was never dead. They just, you know, they let him out. That's the problem. They let him out. He, was, he wasn't supposed to be let out. He was just supposed to live in there forever. In this one, it's kind of suggested he is brought back to life by something. But it's, it's Boris Karloff. He's back to life, and now he is once again trying to resurrect the pharaoh's daughter he had a crush on uh it it's really good i one of my on on the on the upper end of universal monster movies for sure for sure for sure there's a reason this one's a classic um at at least in part because of boris karloff i love karloff in this movie like, he's, he's great as the Frankenstein monster, but he doesn't get to say much as the Frankenstein monster. In this movie, he gets a speaking role, and he does not sound like an Egyptian man at all, but he does sound fucking creepy, because he's Boris Karloff. Karloff just has such a good voice. Ah. Uh, that's I love the Grinch who stole Christmas because Boris Karloff, man, Boris Karloff doing the narration, He's such a good voice, and he it it brings a lot to this character who's supposed to be this like real powerful dude, this and creepy dude because you know he's resurrected from the grave, so you know going around with this like Boris Karloff. This is my Boris Karloff voice. Welcome, boils and ghouls. <laughs> uh, he, he, mm, I hate to say he carries the movie, because there is other good stuff about this movie. I, li I, I like the story. It's kind of a cool story. <laughs> um, of, of, yeah, you know, like, defying the gods and, like, the punishment for that, and... I don't know, it's a, it's a good story. I like the story a lot, too. But, like, uh... Karloff more or less carries the movie. 
the it's a good story. Don't get me wrong. It's a good story, but it's a good story that Karloff helps carry. Because <laughs> I'm not particularly interested in any of the other characters. All three of these, I believe, at least the latter two, have... Like, all the characters have the same names. These are all three. All three movies we watched are loose adaptations of each other, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the later movies. But, uh... <laughs> the, the lead in these movies is an archaeologist named Steve Banning. <laughs> it's like... So fuck... The, the first time someone said it, I'm like... Hold up, wait, is the main character of this movie named Steve Bannon? The fucking Breitbart guy? <laughs> no, no, it's not Steve Bannon, it's Steve Banning. Big difference. He's not a particularly interesting character. I'm not super invested in the, uh, the archaeologist in these movies. But, uh... There's a really funny moment where one of them's just like, like, cause, uh, cause Boris Karloff, obviously, you know, he's an ancient Egyptian man. He can't just go around being like, yep, it's me, Imhotep from th the seventh century BC or whenever. <laughs> so he's, he's posing as like a modern Egyptian man with a lot of money because he has access to a lot of money. And he's he's funding this archaeology trip to where the princess is, the, the where the princess is buried, so he can have her body and resurrect her. And uh, and and he's like funding these guys, but th on the grounds that he gets to keep whatever they find in that tomb. And one of them's like, "Ah, oh, well, the British Museum is more interested in discoveries than claiming things as their own, and I'm like, bull fucking shit, dude. <laughs> the British Museum has stolen fucking everything. It's all stolen shit, man. There is, like, of all three of these movies, there's like a weird, like, anti-colonialist undertone to all of them, because they're all kind of like... Ah, uh, fuck these British people coming into our territory and tearing up all our ancient... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ancient sites? A sacred sites? <laughs> fuck, fuck these British people for coming into our country and taking all our shit, man. That's, that's kind of an undercurrent of all these movies. I'm not saying these movies are at all woke, because there's also definitely some racist shit in this movie. <laughs> this movie, just a touch, just a touch racist. I mean, it was, it's, it's a movie that was made in the 30s, and it's set in Egypt, so you gotta be prepared for, like, a little racism. All things considered, I think they showed pretty decent restraint. The one big thing is, like, and this is only in the 30s version. By the 40s, they were like, nope, that shit doesn't fly. In the 30s version, the mummy can hypnotize a a, mm, a Nubian, is what they call him in the movie. He can hypnotize an African, but he can't hypnotize, you know, the, the good, wholesome white men. So it's like, okay, that's, uh, hmm... It's not, like, explicitly racist, but it's still, like, not a good look. Not a good look. All things considered, though, for a movie from the 30s, probably could have been a lot worse than this. And like I said, it does have that, like, you know, I fuck the British for coming into our land and taking all of our shit, so... Uh, you can go either way with the, the politics of the Mummy movie. I don't know how much else I have to say about this one specifically. I kind of feel like I need to just... Because I tend to, like, talk about one movie at a time. But these three movies are so, like, weirdly codependent. Like, I, I feel like I, I can kind of just talk about all three at once. So, let's move on. But there, there's broader ideas here that, that overlap all three films. 
Because like I said, they're all loose adaptations of each other. Uh, the second movie we watched was uh, The Mummy's Hand, which is also on this box set. Um, which was kind of a remake of The Mummy, I guess, for a, a late 40s audience. That wasn't uncommon. Like, early Hollywood, uh, it was pretty common to just, like, remake old movies, like, a decade later. Uh, just because, like, there was no home media is the thing, you know? No one had VHSs, no one had DVDs. We, we didn't even really show movies on television much back then. It, it happened, it would happen, but it, it was kind of a rare occurrence. So, a lot of people knew of The Mummy, but had never seen The Mummy, so it made sense to just, you know, remake The Mummy uh, with The Mummy's Hand. Uh, it's the same, very similar story, I guess. Uh, you know, archaeologists dig up Imhotep's grave, uh, thus resurrecting Imhotep, and, you know... He's pissed off. I guess I kind of left this out of my description of the first one. He's pissed off and murdering people. Um, he does that in the first movie. He does that in all three movies. He's a little angrier in this one and the Hammer one. Um, he he comes out to the grave and he's murdering people and trying to resurrect the prince. Trying to find the princess to resurrect the princess. Um, this does have the updated detail that when he was buried, Imhotep had his tongue removed. Um, so, you, you know, I was just talking about how great Boris Karloff's voice is in the first movie. In this movie, the mummy can't even talk. And this is sort of the start of the, you know, mummy characters who just sort of mumble. So, like, the pop culture idea of a mummy just sort of goes, oh, oh. That started with this movie because Imhotep had his tongue ripped out, so he can't speak. That's why he moans. Um, in the first Mummy movie, he speaks very clearly because he's Boris Karloff. So that's, that's probably the big update for this movie. That's the big thing that sort of seeped into pop culture after this one. Um, there, the other big difference is that the archaeologists in this movie are a lot more comedic, uh, which does make them a bit more of an interesting presence in this movie as compared to the previous movie. They, they're a little more, I don't know, interesting. They're a little more, <laughs> they, they do more, they do more memorable things because they're supposed to be comedic characters. Honestly, it makes this movie feel like the midpoint between, like, the original Mummy and, like, Abbott and Costello meet the Mummy. Because it's not all the way comedy like Abbott and Costello, but it's definitely more Abbott and Costello-ish than the original Mummy movie. It's sort of the midway point between those two. Um, I have Abbott and Costello meets the Mummy on here. We might do... Probably when we get through, like, most of these Universal movies, we'll, we'll end it off with Abbott and Costello night. Abbott and Costello meet all the the Universal monsters, because there was meets Frankenstein, which I love, uh, meets the mummy I also like, and then there's, like, meets the Invisible Man, or, or meets the Body Snatcher or something. That there's another one. There's at least one other one we could look at. As for the mummy's hand, though, I... It's fine, but, like, it's not as good as the mummy. Like, it's telling basically the same story as the mummy, but not as well. So, I, I feel like if this were a wholly original movie and, and the mummy didn't exist, I would like it better than I do, but... As is, it's just sort of the inferior version of this story, especially since it's not even the last telling of this story. Then we got the Hammer Horror one, and the Hammer Horror one is also better than The Mummy's Hand. So it's like, what's the point in watching The Mummy's Hand when I could watch The Mummy or The Mummy? <laughs> uh, it's It just seems like sort of a... Uh, 
a pointless addition to the mummy franchise. But still, it's it's decent. It's decent enough. It's just sort of, I don't know, the inferior version of something that's been done better more than once. I, I want to talk for a second about how many movies are called The Mummy, right? It astounds me how many movies are just called The Mummy. Because unlike Frankenstein or Dracula, which are based on books, so it makes sense that there's a lot of Frankenstein movies, it makes sense that there's a lot of Dracula movies, The Mummy is an original movie, and it's weird that it's been remade so many times with the same title. Because uh, first you have this The Mummy, the, the Hammer Horror The Mummy, which is weird because usually Hammer Horror would do like Curse of or ho the Horrors of Dracula, Curse of Frankenstein, Curse of the Werewolf to sort of differentiate them from the Universal versions. But for The Mummy, they just said The Mummy. And this is also the closest they ever get to just remaking the Universal one. Because I think this was made, like, in association with Universal. Like, they, they... This was one of the few ones where they were actually directly remaking a Universal monster movie rather than a new adaptation of the same old character. Um, so it's, it's weird that they just called it The Mummy. Um, and then The Mummy got remade in the 90s. That's the one most people are probably familiar with, the Brendan Fraser The Mummy, which... Interesting take on the story. That's... Hmm... I wasn't super into it the first time I saw it, but I, I could definitely revisit it. I wouldn't be afraid to revisit it. It's, it's fine. It's okay. It's definitely an interesting take on the mummy story, um, since it's, it's not super focused on the mummy. It's much more of an action-adventure movie than these more horror adaptations of the story. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the Dark Universe, the mummy. But, of course, it was the only Dark Universe movie, because it fucking sucked. And I don't think... Like, people have talked about all of the problems with the Dark Universe, but something I think doesn't get brought up enough is, like, the Dark Universe was supposed to be based on, like, the old Universal Monster movies from the 30s. Stuff like The Mummy, right? And Frankenstein and Dracula and all that. But it's pretty clear to me that the reason they started with the Mummy is because there was the Brendan Fraser Mummy from the 90s. So you're trying to use 90s nostalgia as a gateway to this franchise based on films from the 30s. It just doesn't seem like it's gonna work. Like, even if the Mummy was successful, I don't think it would have translated to more Dark Universe success because... I think at least part of the audience for The Mummy is coming to The Mummy because of the Brendan Fraser movie. And they don't care about Frankenstein or Dracula or whoever else you want to throw into this universe. Uh, but that's that's uh, my mini rant on the Dark Universe. Let's talk about the Hammer Horror The Mummy, where uh, Peter Cushing plays Steve Banning and... Donald Pleasance plays his father? I, th I, th I think it's his father. I think it's his father that Donald Pleasance is playing. Which is weird, because I would not consider those two actors to be significantly different in age. I I don't think you can cast uh, uh, Donald Pleasance as Peter Cushing's father. So maybe I'm wrong. That's why I'm sort of unsure. I'm like, maybe I misinterpreted this. And it's not his father, but I'm pretty sure it's his father. Um, rare Donald Pleasance appearance in a Hammer Horror movie. And he dies pretty quickly into the movie. He does not have that much screen time. But it's, you know, it's always nice to see Donald Pleasance. I love Donald Pleasance. And 
he was not in many Hammer horror movies, which is weird. Because he is, like, a prominent horror actor. He's been in a lot of horror movies. And he's British. He's very, very British. So it's like, British horror actor. Yeah, he should be in a lot of Hammer horror movies. But he just isn't. I, I, I think he was in more than just this. But this is one of the very few that have Donald Pleasance. But, of course, it does have... Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, who are in all of these goddamn Hammer horror movies. <laughs> uh, Lee as the mummy, and the the thing about this is it's based on it's it's clearly based on the mummy, but it also clearly pulled a lot from the mummy's hand because it also has the detail of him having his tongue ripped out so he can only like moan. When he's resurrected, we do get to hear Christopher Lee's voice. Christopher Lee narrates the flashback that explains uh, how how he came to be, how he is now. But so that's that's a little more Christopher Lee than we got out of Curse of Frankenstein. But I prefer him in talking roles. I I think I think we should have more speaking roles for Christopher Lee. I'm not a big fan of him. Just stumbling around as a monster. It's also the rare Hammer horror movie that doesn't have any sequels. <laughs> I guess that's not true. I, it was mostly Frankenstein and Dracula got all the sequels. Um, those were really the... Well, I, there were Quatermass sequels, but... You know, uh, it's it's weird that Hammer horror focused so heavily on Frankenstein and Dracula... And then they made a Wolfman movie and a Mummy movie and just decided to never make a sequel. Although, there's not a sequel to the Universal Mummy either. That's, uh... That's, that's pretty rare. Usually there were a lot of Universal sequels. So, I, I guess this is just... <laughs> uh, the, the Brendan Fraser Mummy has more sequels than any other adaptation of The Mummy. Because uh, th there were two more Mummy movies, and then there's the the Scorpion King spinoff movies, and there's like five Scorpion King movies. Like, Jesus Christ. Who was asking for this many Scorpion King movies? Uh, directed... This, of course, is directed by Terrence Fisher who does all of the Hammer Horror movies, and that makes him the director we have seen the most times on Matt's Movie Nights, because he has directed so many Hammer Horror movies. I think this is our sixth film from him. Might only be the fifth, but... He's the director we've seen the most times. Good one, Terrence. D d props to you. I do, I really like the Hammer Horror version of this movie. I think it's a very good adaptation. I think it, it brings, it brings back the things I liked about The Mummy, and even The Mummy's Hand, it, it incorporates some of the good aspects of The Mummy's Hand, and sort of improves upon them. Uh, so, I, I think it's a really good adaptation. I think... I I don't know if I could pick a favorite between the Universal Mummy and the Hammer Horror Mummy. I'm leaning Universal, both because it came first and also Boris Karloff. I really like Boris Karloff in that movie. But I think I think they are both good adaptations of the Mummy story, so I, I would recommend both. Uh, the, watch the Universal original, watch the Hammer Horror version. Both very good versions of the mummy. I, I also think this one goes a lot harder on like the anti-colonialist undertones uh, without being as racist as the one from the 30s. I think, I, I, I hate to say it was deliberate because it was still the late 50s and it's not like hammer horror is like super woke or anything. I just... I, but it it feels like they emphasized the 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 anti-colonialist undertones a lot more in the mummy in in the hammer horror one 
Like, like they were aware that that was an interpretation you could have of the original, so they kind of leaned into it a little more. That's not to say this is very deliberately and explicitly an anti-colonialist movie, just... They sort of leaned into that interpretation. They, they, they were aware that people would maybe interpret it that way, and they kind of leaned into that. Or maybe it was, maybe it was just, maybe I'm reading too deep into it. Who knows? Who knows what the director's intentions were? Uh, maybe it was sheer coincidence that it was as anti-colonial as, as I interpreted it to be. Who knows? Either way, recommend The Mummy and The Mummy. The Mummy's Hand, eh. Maybe if if you really like the mummy movies, it might be worth watching as like, okay, yeah, here's more mummy content, but mm, overall, I I think it's the the lesser version of this story. Oh, let's pull up some comments, shall we? So last time I asked what your favorite monster was, um, I don't actually know what my answer to that question would be uh i don't know man i like i like monster movies werewolves i think present a lot of potential there's a lot of potential with uh werewolves because there's always there's got to be a transformation sequence and there's some really good transformation sequences out there my favorite is the company of wolves um, that might be a good question next time we look at some werewolf movies. I like werewolves. I like zombies too, but zombies are sort of a a double-edged sword. Because a zombie by itself is not very scary, so it's easy to make zombies not very scary. The horror of zombies kind of comes from how many of them there are, right? Like, Dracula's hard to kill, but once you kill him, you're safe. Zombies are real easy to kill, but they never stop coming. There's always more zombies. That's the horror of zombies. You can't stop them the way you can a lot of other monsters. John Cleveland chimed in with uh, quite a few answers. Says, favorite serial killer, Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs. I wouldn't count serial killers as monsters. That's actually... Uh, I'm gonna take note of that, because I am definitely going to ask who your favorite movie serial killer is in the future. That would be a good question. Um, hold on to that. Put, 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 put a pin in Hannibal Lecter, man. Um, says, favorite creature, the Graboids from Tremors. Love Tremors. Great movie. Got a Tremors poster right here. I'll put an insert shot of it. That's what it looks like. Uh, favorite kaiju, Godzilla. Obviously, I've talked a lot about Godzilla. Big Godzilla fan, although... I've also said before I prefer Mothra. Mothra is my favorite kaiju, so... And lastly, the werewolves from Dog Soldiers. I have not seen Dog Soldiers, so... That is... One uh, I'm not familiar with. So, you might, you might have to check that one out. Sounds, sounds interesting. Um, thank you for your answer, John. Let me double check. I think John was the only one who answered. Let me double check that no one else... Uh, yeah, no, no other answers to the questions. Rob Jackson said, I might be the only person in the world, but I like Exorcist 2. Granted, I like it in a so bad it's good way, but I still like it. I think most people like Exorcist 2 in a so bad it's good way. It's a very silly movie. I I like Exorcist 2. I think Exorcist 2 is funny. So, please do not be confused by my question tonight. My question has nothing to do with the movies we're looking at. It's, it's loosely tangential. You'll see what I mean in a second. But, uh, I'm going to ask, what's your favorite video game movie? What uh, favorite movie based on a video game? Because most of them are bad, so probably just tell me the one you think is the funniest. We are not watching any video game movies tonight, but, you know, we did the Dead or Alive trilogy. Once again, we're doing a trilogy of Japanese action movies that share a name 
with a popular video game series. It's Sonny Chiba in the Street Fighter series. These came out before the games. This is not a video game movie. Don't don't watch the Van Damme movie. Uh, or do. I like Van Damme. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about next time. I'm talking about the Sonny Chiba Street Fighter movies. That's The Street Fighter, Return of the Street Fighter, and The Street Fighter's Last Revenge. Be talking about that next time. Until then, I'm Matt. Have a nice day.